Shall we open our Bibles to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 22? I want to bring a message this morning about the unpopularity of truth. We find in this Old Testament passage an instance where one man had to stand alone and he had to pay a price for it because what he was saying was unpopular. What he was saying was true, but it didn't matter. It was unpopular because it went against what some others wanted to believe. And we find this courageous example of standing alone uh, with the case of Micaiah the prophet, who in the face of many other false prophets stood his ground and prophesied the truth amidst the presence of kings as they sat on thrones. Now I've subtitled this message this morning that courageous nonconformity is a Christian's duty. Courageous nonconformity is a Christian's duty. We are not to reflect the world. We are to correct the world. In fact, the Bible says we are to reject the world in order to follow Christ. Leaving the world is something that Jesus demanded if we would follow him. And of course, in the Bible, it says all that's in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. These are not of God, but of the world. And so here we find in this wonderful example of courage, a man who stood firm in the midst of danger and spoke the truth of God. And we see in 1 Kings 22, verse 1, and they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now, I just want to set the setting of uh, as far as so we can understand what's happening here, Jehoshaphat is a good king, but he had a, a bad habit of aligning himself with bad kings. Ahab was a bad king, but because they shared the same geography, often one enemy that one had would be the enemy of the other one as well, and so he felt it necessary uh, to join with him to battle a common enemy. And so this was one of those instances where Syria was a common enemy. So Jehoshaphat, a good king in Judah, where they had the legitimate temple and the legitimate priest and the, the, the work of God, Ahab was a wicked king who had a false temple, false prophets, and they worshiped Baal. Uh, and so this was the setting, all right? And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Now, in those days, before kings went to battle, they would, they would consult the, the prophets. Now, if they were pagan kings, they would, they would consult their pagan prophets. If they were uh, le the legitimate king of Israel, they would, they would ask the Lord God. They would go to the Lord, the true God, and pray and say, Lord, should we go to battle? Will we be successful? And so this is the scene that, that is going on at this time. Inquire of the Lord. Then the king of Israel, this would be Ahab, the, the wicked king, gathered the prophets together, about 400 men. Now that's a lot of prophets in that temple area there, that throne area rather, uh, 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat, that's the king of Israel, the good king, said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, besides that we might inquire of him? Now he had enough discernment to realize that these were syncophants, these were echo chamber men, these were uh, the king's hirelings. He wanted a real word from God. He said, I'd like to hear from a genuine prophet, if you don't mind. That's basically what he's saying. And the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said unto Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Now, this is what you have here. There is a man who's with the true God, the one who tells the truth, but I hate him. And it, why does he hate him? For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. In other words, he said, don't write him off. Let's hear what he has to say. And then the king of Israel called an officer and said, hasten hither Micaiah, the son of Imlah. 
And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. So here you have these two kings in their royal robes, sitting in special seats, and this 400 prophets all prophesying uh, with a positive message of victory uh, before them. And in walks Micaiah. And Zedekiah, the son of Shenanah, said, uh, made him horns of iron. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou, thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. So he made these horns, this uh, implement that looked like horns of a, of a bull. And I imagine what he did is he, he put them on his head and he, he went this way and he went that way. And he said, this is how you're going to push him, king. Yeah, this is how you're going to win. You're going to push him just like a bull pushes people out of the way. Uh, you go, king. You're the man. And so he was really building up the king. And all of these are nodding their heads saying, yeah, that's how it's going to happen. And so they were just having a big free-for-all of positive prophesying, quote, unquote, uh, to the king. Uh, but now here's what happens. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. Now, by the way, you know what, what good is, don't you? What you think is good. You know what's positive, don't you? What you think is positive. Uh, you see, he, 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 he prophesied evil against me. No, he prophesied truth against you, which is good if you want truth. So he's being encouraged, as we say, threatened. Okay, you fall in line. You speak the party line. You go along. Don't be a naysayer. And Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Now that's how a prophet of God answers a question like that. He says, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to say what God has told me to say. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah... Shall we go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, uh, or shall we forbear? And he answered him. Now, I'm going to answer him in the way that I'm sure he answered him, okay? Go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver thee, and he will deliver it into the hand of the king. It was dripping with sarcasm. The sarcasm was so rich you could cut it with a knife. The king picked up on it. I mean, he's just being really uh, sarcastic in a way that can't be missed, okay? And he says, and the king said unto him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? Now, he picked up on that he was just mouthing off. He was just being sarcastic. So then Micaiah straightened himself up and he got real serious. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. Now he's prophesying the truth. He said, I saw a wipeout. I saw a defeat. I saw a failure. I saw the king dead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? Now, of course, he was prophesying the truth, but here's the thing. Ahab was not interested in the truth. Ahab was interested in people who agreed with him. And this scene has been repeated all through history. It is, uh, this situation is in uh, place now in the political world and in some cases the, uh, the, the religious world. So he says, didn't I tell you that he was going to do that? Didn't I tell you that he was going to say uh, these type of things? Uh, and he said, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Now here we have a vision that was given to Micaiah. And this is like a, a, a little peek into the heavenly scene, if you will, of how things are done in the spiritual dimension. Uh, it's a, it's a, a way of communicating that the prophets had of what was going on here. Uh, these men, uh, Jehoshaphat and Ahab, are trying to figure out how 400 prophets can say one thing, and one prophet who claims to be the prophet of Jehovah uh, can say another. How, how is this happening? All right. So he says, the Lord is on his throne and the host of heaven. That's all the angels and spirits are before him. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab 
that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. Now, I submit to you, this passage has been wrestled with throughout the centuries by interpreters and exegetes and Bible commentators, and it's a tough one. But I think we must understand that what's going on here is we understand that the devil himself cannot do anything unless it first goes through the almighty uh, eternal counsels of God himself, and then it is allowed to happen. You remember when God and Satan had a conversation about Job? God brought it up. Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, yeah, I've considered Job. He only serves you because you've made him rich. If you take away all his riches, he'll curse you to his face. And God said, well, go ahead and do that then. Take away all his riches. Now, listen, it's possible from Scripture that we learn that evil spirits can have access to God himself for eternal purposes. I don't pretend to explain it. I don't pretend to even understand it, but it is a reality that is presented here and elsewhere in the scripture. So let's just read it and believe what we're reading. God is saying, who's going to make him go to this war where he is going to fall? And one said on this manner and another on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Wow. Wow. Now, we wrestle with this, but a bigger thing to wrestle with, a harder question to answer, would be the concept that Satan would have the power to just up and do something without God even knowing about it without God being aware. Listen, when the devil came to Adam and Eve in the garden in the form of a servant, a serpent rather, God wasn't taking a nap. He wasn't on a trip somewhere. He wasn't, uh, you know, distracted. God knew that was happening. Uh, Listen, when Satan took away uh, Job's riches and then even took away his health, It was by direct orchestration and permission of God for a higher purpose. We must understand that there's nothing that happens without God's awareness and without his tacit permission. So God has a plan that judgment is going to come upon Ahab. And he's going to incorporate the lying prophets of Baal to convince him to go. And so that's the plan. It's, it's, It's part of what God is doing here. And he said, Thou shalt do so. And now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Now, he's telling him what's happening. He's letting him know. Listen, the Lord's allowing Satan to trick you. The Lord is allowing an evil spirit to deceive you. Understand, these are liars. The Lord is is letting them lie to you, but he sent me to tell you the truth. Now, listen. When there is lying and there is truth, we have to choose. That's what goes on in the human family. Truth and lies exist in this fallen world. Satan is operating. He is the deceiver. He is the liar. He is the father of lies. But there is also truth. Truth is here. God is the author of truth. And Micaiah is the true prophet of God. And he is telling Ahab to his face, these men are lying to you. They are telling you things that are not true. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. But Zedekiah, the son of Chenehane, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek. Now, here's what happens when you tell the word of God. When you tell the truth in the face of lies, they will hate you. They will hit you. Listen, they may even homicide you. They may take you out. He hit him on the cheek. He punched him right in the face. And he says, which way went the spirit of the Lord for me to speak unto thee? In other words, he says, you know so much. Who is it that told me to hit you in the face? So he he asked the question and Micaiah gave him an answer. He said, behold, thou shalt see in the day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. He said, listen, when you're somewhere because everything's gone bad and the the enemy has defeated uh, your army and has killed your king and you go to hide yourself in a secret room, then it'll come to you. (laughs) You want an answer? It'll come to that. It was you. All right. 
Uh, and the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison. Now here's a fellow who told him the truth, but put him in jail. Feed him with bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I come in peace. Now here is what they are going to do to this one source of truth. We're going to put him in prison. We're taking away his freedom and we're going to make him miserable. Bread of affliction means rotten, old, stale, crummy, moldy bread. And water of affliction would be lukewarm water that might even be tainted enough to make you sick. I think my grandma might have been reading this passage of Scripture when she warned me about the dangers of the detention home if I was truant from school. Uh, she told me they would put me in a room and lock the door and it would be dark and they'd feed me through a hole in the wall, uh, lukewarm water and stale bread. And if I cried, nobody cared. And if I got sick, nobody would tend to me. And that's how they do it if you miss school. Well, uh, she had to warn me that way to get me to go to school because I made up my mind I hated it so much I wasn't going to go. And that kept me in school until I grew up long enough to realize that school really isn't so bad. But can you imagine the treatment they gave Micaiah for telling the truth? And here's what he says. Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. And I believe he was saying that as they carted him away. Hearken unto me. Listen to me. He's warning them. Don't follow him. Don't go to your death. Don't follow. Uh, so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, now this is Ahab speaking again, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. Now, isn't that interesting? I've sent the true prophet of God to prison. Uh, my, my servant hit him in the mouth. I'm going to feed him stale water and stale bread. But what if he's right? What if he's right? So I'm not going to go out with my kingly robes on. Jehoshaphat, you wear your kingly robes because I know how you are, but I'm going to disguise myself. I'm just going to be an ordinary soldier here. He's thinking, maybe I can cheat this prophecy. Maybe I can cheat the word of God by disguising myself. They won't know it's me. I'm just somebody else. That's what he's thinking. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. But the king of Syria commanded his 30, that is his top guard, and two captains that had rule over his chariot, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only the king of Israel. Now he had a vendetta against Ahab, and so he says, I just want you to get him. I want you to fight him. But he had disguised himself. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, who was wearing his kingly robes, that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out, now, I wonder what he cried out. I'm not Ahab would, would have been a good one. I'm, I'm Jehoshaphat, the king of, of, of Judah. So whatever he cried out, they realized something. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him because they'd been told only to go after the king of Israel. So that saved uh, his life. And a certain man, just a soldier, drew a bow at a venture. In other words, he just shot his arrow. He just shot his arrow. He drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. That is where it tied together with leather between the, the armored plates. Wherefore, he said unto the driver of his chariot, turn thine hand and carry me out of the host for I am wounded. Now he's in a chariot appearing to be just an ordinary charioteer rather than the king of, of, of Israel, the northern uh, kingdom and, and, uh, of, of Israel. And so uh, he, he gets hit right in the place between the, the armor plates where it could go, just as luck would have it, just as chance would have it. But as we know, God directed that arrow directly to the one place where he could receive a mortal wound. And so he says, take me out uh, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even, and the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a pro proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, every man to his city, every man to his own country. So that is, they retreated, they, went, they ran away. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria, 
and one washed the chariot of the pool in Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor according to the word of the Lord which he spake. There's some interesting Hebrew wordage in verse 38 that is interesting about the place where he was uh, uh, washed up and his chariot was washed. It was the place where the false temple prostitutes would bathe and the dogs licked his blood there. That was a fulfillment of the prophecy uh, that, uh, that Elijah had given or Elisha had given. Now, here's what I want us to understand about this, all right? This is nothing new. It is nothing old. It is universal. It is happening now. It happens in our country. It happens all around the world that truth can become unpopular and lies can become popular. There are many times when the majority of people believe something that is wrong, that is incorrect, and then is a lie. And usually it is in the world of politics and in the world of religion. These two things are married together no matter how people may try to uh, dissect it and no matter how they may try to claim, no, we're not guided by religious concepts, we're guided by science or we're guided by facts. Well, it's interesting how religion and science seem to go hand in hand more than people are willing to admit. Uh, there are some things that science teaches so squarely and so surely that anybody except a religious lunatic uh, would, uh, would believe it except religion told them not to believe it. And we have now in our nation today a nation that does not even know, understand or know uh, what a man is or what a woman is. Uh, we, are, we have lost our collective minds. Uh, if you go to any other country in the world, primitive, educated, or anything, unless they've been to one of our American sociology classes, they can tell you easily who a man is and who a woman is. Ask any five-year-old uh, that, that has lived any length of time and has a normal functioning brain. But let's understand, the world system wants you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, to make nice, to get along, to fall in line, to be a team player. Well, I want to go on record as saying this, that it is the Christian's duty to be a nonconformist in the face of lies and falsehood. Micaiah was a righteous man for standing alone. Can you imagine 400 prophets, all of them prophesying and working up a frenzy and going around with horns and pretending to push away the enemy, and, and, and he, you're all by yourself telling the truth, and they put you in prison for it and afflict you for it. So this is what was going on with him and it is in the world ever since Cain slew Abel, there has been a religious war uh, between those who follow wickedness and those who follow righteousness. I often think of nonconformists throughout the Bible, and one of my favorite nonconformists was John. John the Baptist was a nonconformist. I mean, he was different than everybody else. Uh, for one thing, uh, he was living in the wilderness. Now, he came from a priestly family. He could have had a, a nice existence uh, working as a priest, uh, as his father did. But no, he went out into the wilderness to be a prophet. He wore camel hair and a leather belt, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He was a, a, a mountain man, if you will. And he preached a, a simple message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so he was a, a nonconformist. Uh, listen, for a while, even Herod, the wicked king, would listen to John. Why? Because he was so unique. He was so interesting. His voice was so loud, and, and, and his, he spoke with a sense of urgency. And something about Herod was attracted to John because he said, maybe this is a real prophet. Maybe he is supernatural. Maybe he does have something from God. And he listened. And you know what's interesting? The Bible even says that Herod obeyed John in many things. So I would say today in our language we might use today, that, that John the Baptist was Herod's TV preacher. In other words, he didn't go to his church, he wasn't in his congregation, but he sure liked the entertainment value that he provided, and so he listened to him and even did what he said. Until he pointed his finger, it is unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now listen, if John had just said adultery is a sin, he might have kept his head. But he made it political when he pointed at the king and he said, in this particular instance, you king, it's illegal, it is wrong, unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. And therefore he was put in prison. Let's understand something. It is the duty of Christians to be courageously a nonconformist 
when in the face of evil, when in the face of falsehood. Paul was a nonconformist. He didn't let people push him around. He didn't let the, uh, the, the, the Sanhedrin push him around. Uh, he didn't even let the legalists within the church push him around. Uh, he was the kind of person who would take a stand even when people opposed him. When they had a discussion in the church about whether or not Gentiles had to become Jews to be saved, the Apostle Paul stood with the, what the Spirit of God had led him to, that the gospel could go out to the Gentiles and they didn't have to become Jews first. They didn't have to follow the law of Moses. They could come to faith in Christ. And there were some who opposed him. And in Galatians chapter 2, verse 5, these people who opposed him, he said this, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Now, what the Apostle Paul was saying is there were people who tried to treat me as if they were higher than me, as if they were over me, because they were who they were. And he said, but when it comes to the truths of God, God doesn't respect anybody's person. They were wrong. And therefore, I did not submit myself to them. He was a nonconformist. You ever think about Paul would have had an easier life if he just wasn't so hard to get along with? I mean, you know, one time a bunch of Christians, they said, Paul, we love you. You're great, but you need to go to another place because we need to have some peace around here. Uh, every time you come in, there's, there's either a revival or a riot or both. And, and, they, and, then, and then he left and said, then had they peace. But he was a nonconformist. Uh, listen, his obvious stance was more than just a personality quirk with him. It was an anointing. It was something from God. He was courageous. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a nonconformist. That great preacher who perhaps uh, is responsible for the salvation of many thousands of people, perhaps more than any in the modern age, uh, his work is still ongoing. His books are still in print. His sermons are, are still in print. And he was an amazingly influential, at one time pastoring the largest church in the world, uh, planting uh, missions and orphanages, uh, a great preacher for God. And yet they, uh, in London and other places, they mocked him and made fun of him. Uh, they would draw political cartoons of him, uh, mocking him and making him look funny. Uh, they would accuse him of being a, a baboon. Uh, they would accuse him of being a, a big, a mouthy cannon. They, they would caricature him in every way that they could. They said he is uneducated, but yet he was one of the most educated men the world ever saw. He read nonstop, but he had never had an official degree. Uh, but Charles Haddon Spurgeon was uh, unmercifully criticized by the religious elites of his day, and yet the people came and heard the word of God, and more work was being done through Spurgeon's ministry than any of them put together. It's amazing the hate that can come from those when you don't fall in the line. One of the things that he grieved about was he was in the Baptist Union. And in the Baptist Union, they had liberalism and, and, and they had people who de denied the word of God and they denied the truths of, of Christianity. And he said, we need to censor that. We need to speak against that. And they wouldn't do it. And so Spurgeon had to leave the Baptist Union because he was not going to associate with those who had downgraded. And it was the downgrade controversy, they call it, that downgraded the faith of Christ. And so he had to stand alone. And he was an independent Baptist. Uh, he lost his friends. He lost his union. He lost his association. And it grieved him at his heart. And he wept over it. And many people believe that it contributed to his death in his late 50s uh, because of the heartbreak of those type of things. But he was a nonconformist. He was not going to cave in. Why do people hate people that refuse to go along with the majority. Well, one thing is people hate people who make them feel guilty. Listen, when you are on the side of sin and someone points at it and calls it sin and therefore implies that you are sinning, you're going to hate them. Now, unless you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit of God is in your heart, you may not like hearing it. It may be hard to hear. It may hurt your feelings. But you will love the truth, and you may even love the one who said it, even though it's unpleasant for you to hear. Listen, some of the harshest 
words I have ever heard came from men who loved me in Jesus Christ and told me what I needed to hear. I had a mentor named Bob Woosley. He was the pastor who preached the message the night I got saved. And he took me under his wing and he mentored me and he told me what I needed to hear. And that, listen, there was a time when I got into his office and he spoke to me in, in such a, a, a rebuking uh, tone that he parted my hair right down the middle. And that was back when I had hair. Maybe that's why it's parted in the middle today. Uh, he, he told me what for. Uh, he, he told me where I was going wrong. He told me what I needed to do to get right. He told me I'm never going to amount to anything unless I deal with this issue and that issue. And I sat there and I tried to hold back the tears because I knew everything he said was right and true. And so there came a time when I got right with God and I went and thanked him later for being tough on me and telling me what I needed to hear. Now listen, somebody, somebody, somebody needs to have permission to tell you when you're wrong, when you're messed up, when you're off track, uh, when you're full of beans. Uh, listen, if you don't have anybody like that in your life, uh, you're, you are poorer for it. Uh, all of us sometimes need to be told straight away what is true. But people hate people who make them feel guilty. People hate people who challenge their prejudices. Listen, you want to get somebody mad with you? You want to get somebody to hate you? You want to get somebody upset? You just try to tell them that that person over there that they hate might not be so bad. You try to tell them that group of people over there that they look down on, maybe you shouldn't look down on them. You try to tell them that maybe they're your equals. Maybe they're no better or you're no better than them. Oh, they'll hate you. They'll, they'll get mad. They'll get upset. Listen, if you come into a church and the church has cliques in it, the church has hierarchy, the church has the big shots and the, the little shots, and you try, to, you try to let the people know, well, may, maybe this person's important too. Oh, boy. Listen, you know, it, it's, it's a shame that, that people, some Christians, it's not enough that they're better than they were. They've got to be better than you. That's not what church is about. When we come to church, we don't come to feel better than someone else. We come to compare ourselves to the perfect standard of Jesus Christ and realize we've got work to do on us. I've got work to do on me. And while I preach to you and while I give the word of God, I want you to know I've already preached to myself. I've already had to deal with some stuff. And sometimes right in the middle of my sermon, God will speak to me and says, yeah, you better deal with that when you get home. Listen, we all have some things we've got to deal with. We need the Holy Spirit to have freedom to tell us what we need to hear. Listen, people hated Jesus. He was a nonconformist if there ever was one. Jesus, when he wanted to tell a story about a good man, he made the hero of the story a Samaritan. That person from the other side of the tracks, that person that you hate, that person that you think is cursed by God, that person that you think you can't even walk in their shadow, you can't even share a meal with them, you can't sit in a chair close to them, that's the one I'm going to talk about and present him as a hero. You want to know another hero? Jesus took the publican in the temple, the one everybody hated, the one who was in league with Rome, a tax gatherer, and he said he and a priest were in the same room, the Pharisee and the priest prayed this way, and the the, the publican prayed another way and he said the publican went to his house justified rather than the other why because he prayed forgive me lord for i'm a sinner listen you, you know why they hated jesus because jesus loved the people that they didn't want god to love jesus included the people god didn't that they didn't want god to include listen jesus was hated rejected slandered mocked falsely accused persecuted beaten tortured and crucified because this world could not tolerate the truth personified. Jesus was truth come down. Pilate said, what is truth? And he walked away, not even listening for an answer. It was a mocking thing to say. Oh, what if Pilate had said, what is truth? I want to hear it. Please tell me. I'll sit and be quiet and I'll open my mind and I'll open my heart if you will tell me what is the truth. Jesus would have told him. And if Pilate had received the truth, he could have been saved. He'd have probably lost his job. But that would have been all right. Lots of Christians through history have had to lose their jobs because they came to Jesus Christ. Nonconformity. 
the unpopularity of the truth. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. The, the Apostle Peter, through the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking to Christians in general, and he says this, Beloved, think it not strange that concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Now, what he's saying is this. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. If you go through hard times, don't be surprised. We have been warned. We were told this would be the case. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, what Peter is saying here is this is not a surprise. This is the deal. This is the Christian way. We're going to be hated. We're going to be uh, rejected. We're going to be canceled. We're going to be discounted. We're going to be written off by society. Don't be surprised. But also understand that just as this happened to Christ and yet he is in his glory, you will receive glory too. John chapter 15, Jesus is speaking. John chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. Listen, if Micaiah had come out of his cell and come out and, and tried to go along and said, yeah, he'll do it. I mean it. Yeah, but God's in on this. You bet. He's in. And that's all he'd have done. He could have uh, been uh, just uh, uh, treated well. Okay? If the world... If, if, if you are the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. How about you? How about you? Where do you stand when false science says one thing and Holy Scripture says another? I stand with Holy Scripture. Where do you stand when societal fads say one thing but Holy Scripture says another? We must stand with Holy Scripture and let societal fads go the way of the world. Listen, if you have a moderate IQ, I'll go one more than that. If you have a below average IQ, but a working knowledge of the Word of God, you are smarter than anyone who has a very high IQ and discounts the truth of the Word of God. You have more knowledge, you have more wisdom, you have more operating ability, you have more common sense, you have more divine revelation. It doesn't matter what your IQ is or how many letters dangle off the end of your name. If you want wisdom, go to the Word of God and find it and read it and believe it. We have today an understanding from God. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many, many there be which go in thereat. Jesus is teaching this. This is life. This is how things are put together. There's two roads. Two roads, only two. There's the wide, popular road that leads to destruction, and many will go down that road. And then he said, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto, unto life, and few there be that find it. Jesus, telling the truth, said there's two roads and the majority are on the wrong path. The majority are on the wrong road. Only a few are on the, white, on the right road. You see, being a nonconformist simply means this. We don't conform to falsehood. We don't conform to the world. But we are transformed to the truths of God. I want to be a transformist. I want to be changed into the truth of God. I want to agree with what God knows to be true. 
when we join the Christian family, we join a wonderful group of people, many of whom have gone on before. You think about this. We are part of Abraham. We're part of Isaac and Jacob. We're part of, of the prophets. We are part of the apostles. We are part of the early church. We are heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We have royal blood in our veins. We have the truth of God that corrects this world, and we can stand on it and believe it and be correct in what we believe. When we stand with Christ, we're standing with Moses and Joshua and Elijah and David and Daniel and Isaiah and all the heroes of the faith and all the Christians throughout the church age who have stood their ground and spoken the truth in the face of evil. When Peter and John were preaching and healing and teaching in Christ, they were beaten, they were whipped. And they said, don't speak anymore in this name. And they said, whether it be right to obey you or obey God, judge ye, we're going we're to obey God. Listen, there's going to become more and more instances as this godless age gets more godless and gets more antagonistic against the things of God, it's going to become where more and more we Christians are going to have to make a decision about standing with God in the face of increasing evil. We may even have to come to a point where we practice civil disobedience if it comes to it in order to keep from lining up with the world and what they say we must do. We may receive persecution. We may be counted as second-class citizens, even in this country that was founded on the principles of the Word of God. I don't know how long it'll take to do that, and I'm hoping the Lord will come before that happens. But I do know this. By the grace of God, I want to be a nonconformist. By the grace of God, I want Him to encourage me and, and give me grace and give me the ability to stand alone if necessary, even if it costs me something, even if it means I lose my liberty or I lose my money or I lose my uh, favorability in this world. Uh, I want to serve the Lord because one day we're going to be there and it's going to be a different story then. Jesus is going to say, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. And those that are on the sheep on my right hand, those that are not on my left hand, those that are not with me will scatter. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Listen, I want to be among those who bow the knee and confess with the tongue that he is Lord all through eternity. Dear Father, help us to be nonconformists. Lord, help us to be willing to stand alone. Help us to have the courage to say what's true, even in the face of what's false. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Let's stand.